what's going on. It's a little loud in here, but this is going to be the Bankroll Challenge Part 6. Uh, we're at Charlestown Casino this time, switching it up from MGM. So we're going to buy it for 300 It's a 1-2 game, so it's a little bit more than 100 BBs, but decided to spice it up a little bit. It's Friday night. Let's go have some fun. So let's get right into the hands. Let's go. All right, so we're starting off this session ASAP with a premium. We have two red queens under the gun. I've raised to 11. I definitely raised smaller here in Charlestown but since it's 1-2, which is natural. So anyways, I get three callers and... We go up to a flop of ace, eight, eight. So obviously not loving this flop with pocket queens, especially going this multi-way. Anybody could have an ace here. People love to call small raises with aces, any ace. So I check and it checks all the way around. And now the turn is a 10. So I'm not gonna do nothing again. I check and then it checks all the way to the button who decides to bet 20. Now, I know that if he had an ace on the button, he would have bet on the flop with his ace or even an eight probably. And so I decided to call one time just to see what he wants to do on the river. And the river is now another eight. So I can rule out quads more than likely. And the question is, does he have an ace or does he not? So I check, trying to see what he's going to do on the river. And actually, he decides to check it back. So when he checks back, I know that he probably just hit his 10. So I show my pocket queens and pocket queens is the winner. And it's always good to start off with a win on your first hand. Let's see if we can keep the trend going that way. So in this next hand, I got what I call a premium in a single raise pot. We have king, queen of diamonds. Super pretty. So I'm under the gun, and I raise it up to 12. I get two calls from the button and the cutoff. And we're off to a flop, which comes jack, 10, 5, with two hearts and one diamond. So I'm open-ended and I have a backdoor diamond draw and along with two overs. So I decided to bet 15 into the field and only the cutoff calls, button folds. And now the turn is a five of diamonds. So we pick up big time equity. So we're open-ended with the straight and a flush draw. So now I decide to ramp up the pressure here. I'm going to bet 45 and the cutoff thinks about it for a second looks at their cards, and then they actually decide to lay it down. So although I wouldn't have been too mad to see a call, I still only have king high, and I know I'm up against a pair at least. So it's always good to see that fold, but if they did call, I had a lot of equity to improve. So once again, that's two hands in a row. Can we make it three? Okay, so we're going for the trifecta here. We have ace, queen, all suit. There's an under the gun raise to 15. When it gets to me, nothing left to do but make a mandatory three bet up to 50. And it gets to the button, and he thinks about it for a second. Um, I'm thinking he's thinking between calling or folding, but he actually decides the other route, and he rips it all in. So it folds back to me. I'm thinking about instantly just mucking my hand because I know I'm always up against a monster. But then when I get the count, he only has 110. And so I only got to put in 60 more to win a pot of 240. So I only need 25% equity for this to be profitable. So y'all in the comments, what is the worst possible hand that he could have besides aces? If you said the answer is ace king, you would be correct because the second worst hand is not pocket kings. I have 28% equity versus pocket kings and I only have 23.5% versus ace king, which is the borderline of profitability. So I'm actually hoping that he has king king, but unfortunately that's not what happens. He actually shows ace king, so we're drawing extremely thin and unfortunately we see an ace high flop. And then no queen, nowhere else on the board, and we lose. I mean, even if he would have called, it would have been the same result because he's so shallow. If he calls with ace-king, he sees the ace. I bet like 30. He goes all in for like 35 more. I call, and I lose. So it's rather unfortunate, though. Um, kind of was a big blow to the stack. I was barely up a little bit at this point, so now I'm down. But it's nothing left to do but try to make it back. So a few hands later, we get a very pretty hand, 9, 10 of spades. We are in the plus one. There's a limp. I raise it up to 15. We have two callers in late position, and when it gets to the limper, he decides to go for the old school OMC limp raise, but his sizing is only 35, so I have one of the best hands at the wrist to crack aces and kings, and so I decide to go ahead and stick in the call. 
I know I'm incentivizing the players behind me to call, but that's actually what I want. Because if I think that he has aces or kings, there's no point in trying to isolate with a hand that's behind. And so I actually want the extra money to give me even more price to win. And this hand does perform very well multi-way. So either way, we all are off to the flop four ways. And it comes 9-3-3. Three, three. So yes, I do flop top pair, but the board is paired here. So when the OMC decides to go wall in, I actually snap fold because I know that I'm only drawing to another nine. If the board wasn't paired, of course I would have called, seeing as there was one spade on the board, I could have went back door. But as play, I fold and slowly but surely everyone else folds and I'm about 100% sure that he had queens or better. So I'm not really mad about my fold. I know it was the right fold. It just sucks that after losing a big pot, you lose another pot and you just start to feel like you're just hemorrhaging your chips. But you gotta try to keep focus, um, not to tilt off and just keep on battling when you get your spots. All right, so now we're looking down at pocket nines. There's an under the gun raise to 10. Two people call in front of me. So when it gets to me, I definitely could be putting in a squeeze here, but I'm probably just gun shy from the last couple pots. So I just decided to stick in the call, play it as a set mine or nothing, but the flop actually comes out pretty good. It is six, seven, 10. So we have a gut shot and our pocket nines could very well be the best hand. So when the razor decides to bet out for 20, the cutoff, decides to jam for 66. So now when it gets to me, I'm trying to do the math in my head. It's 66 into a pot of 126 if I call. So I'm getting two to one. I need 33% equity. If he has a 10 in his hand, then I'm gonna have about 24, 25% equity. But let's say he has a hand like seven, eight pair in a straight draw. I have that hand totally handcuffed. And so overall, I know that my call should be profitable against the whole range on what he would do that with, especially because he is a small stack. A lot of times when somebody has a small stack, if they hit any part of the board, they're just going to rip their hand in and pray. So instead of just calling, even though the 66 does put the under the gun all in, I decide to put my whole stack in, hoping that maybe it'll scare him and I can just go heads up. I don't want to see any other cards. And he actually does fold. And the turn is an ace, which is extremely ugly. And the river is a deuce. But he actually shows he has queen nine of hearts. So he had an over card and backdoor hearts and a gut shot. So I'm not too mad with that. And I'm just really glad that I thought it through and realized that I was making a profitable call. And I'm glad that it held. And now we're finally back on the trail to win some hands. So in this hand, we're in the big blind with ace nine. There's a plus two open to 10. There's two callers. So when it gets to me, my only two options here are call or fold. Eh, whatever. I want to get in there, try to get into some hands and make some money back. So I stick in the call. And we have a magical flop of ace, nine, four with two hearts. So I'm first to act in this hand and I'm going to go for the check raise, seeing that there's a flush draw. But unfortunately, when I check, it actually checks all the way around. And so that's very unfortunate and even more unfortunate when the turn is a seven of hearts. So the flush does get there, but I'm going to go ahead and stick in a bet of 20. It folds back around to the preflop aggressor and he decides to bump me up to 45. And at this moment, I'm thinking he could have a flush and is just trying to squeeze some value out of me. And my buddy walks up to me and this is what I tell him as he's walking up to me mid-hand. Where did Mike just go? Um, I'm in the middle of getting cool. Oh, shit. Yeah. I gotta watch my shit. So nothing like your poker buddy that wants to watch you get cooler than the hand, but the river is a three offsuit, and now I check, and he does something I was not expecting. I was thinking he was gonna put out a decently sized bet, but he puts out a block size bet of 15. And so now I know he definitely doesn't have a flush and I just can't stand by that. So I decided to raise to 75. I know that he's not gonna do this with a flush. So if he did, then power to him. But I raised it up to 75 and now he's in the tank. And as I'm looking at his face, I can tell that he's actually genuinely concerned. And so now I'm thinking that he probably has either a really strong ace, ace king, ace queen, or something along those lines. And he's just trying to decide if he should call or fold. And he actually comes to the decision to fold 
but you won't believe the hand he folded. He folded ace four. Yes, he folded aces up. And because my boy had came up, I was already planning on leaving after this next hand. And so I said, all right, I'll show you, bro. He showed me and he made an incredible fold. So shout out to him. Uh, tough lay down there. But either way, happy that we're winning a decent sized pot. And time for the next one. All right, so in this final hand, we have 10-8 of diamonds. My poker buddies, Quinn and Michael, are here watching me. After this, we plan on going to the bar and talking over some hands. But either way, I need to show them how to play some poker. So I call in the small blind, and everyone else calls. Under the gun limper, the two middle position players call. So we're five ways to the flop, and it comes king, seven, three, with two diamonds. So obviously we have a flush draw. And so it checks all the way to the pre raiser, and he decides to lead out for 25. When he bets out for 25, I can't fold. I have a flush draw, back to a straight draw. So maybe I could be putting in a raise, but I want to just call and see what the field does. And they all actually fold. And so the turn is a four. And when I check, the raiser quickly checks back. So now I know he doesn't have top pair. He would definitely put in a bet here with that. So I'm putting his hand as maybe an ace high or something marginal. And so when the river is a nine, I think about it. And I got to show my young friends how to do this. So I bet out for 75. And of course, it does look like Miss Diamonds, which is what I have. But also, let's say I had King Queen or maybe I had two pairs somehow or I had pocket nines and ran into a set on the river. I would do the same bet sizing. And so he thinks about it for a while and then he actually elects to fold. So I get it through, get to show my young ones how to do it. And actually, after we go talk about some hands and they leave, I say, you know what? I'm not done yet because even after this bluff and winning this pot, I'm down about 75. So I want to actually get back even and book a win for the session. So we have a couple, I guess you can call them late night bonus hands because now it is after midnight. So let's see what happens then. All right. So we started recording this hand a little bit late, but just um, a couple things to note. There's been a few hands where I've raised one C bet and it gets through. And so at this point now, I'm actually am about even. But either way, the action in this hand is we have ace-king offsuit in the button. There's a $12 straddle. In Charlestown, you're allowed to straddle under the gun to any amount. So this time it was 12. There's one caller. And when it gets to me, I bump it up to 45. And only the straddler calls. So we're off to a flop, which comes nine jack deuce. And so when he checks, I decide to throw out a C-bat of 40, which is a little bit under 40% of the pot. And he calls. So the turn is a king, and when he checks, I decide to check because the open-ended of queen 10 did get there now. So my check does a lot of things. It is pot control, it's deception, and it's information because I'll know what he wants to do on the river. So when the river is a three and he checks again, I know he doesn't have a straight and I know he doesn't have two pair. So now I'm going to put out a bet just to target a jack. So I don't want to go too large. I decided to bet out for 60. And I'm actually hating myself for that because he calls like instantly and I show my ace king and it's good. So definitely if I would have sized up, it looked like he would have called. But as played, I thought that that was a good bet. What do you think? You think I should have sized up or 60 was about right? It's about 30 percent, 35 percent of the pot. So either way, this puts us into the positive. So we only have one more hand to go over and then we're going to tally up the totals. All right, so now we're on the button with king four of clubs and a quasi limp pot. The reason why I say that is because the plus two decides to open raise to six. And to his defense, that is the standard raise size online. But in live poker, that's just never going to cut it. So the cutoff calls, I call, and the big blind calls as well. The flop is ace four seven. And so if anybody bets, I'm going to fold. All I have is bottom pair. I'm not going to try to hold on versus the field. But it checks all the way around. And the turn is a four. So we now have trips with the top kicker. And so when it checks, the cutoff decides to put out a bet of 12. Now, he could be trying to put a stab out there. And there's no flush draw. So I'm going to just flat call and see what the field wants to do. They all decide to fold. So now we're just going heads up to the river, which is a nine. And now he bets nothing. He checks. And that sucks. But I have to decide on my own what sizing that I should make. 
and I don't want to go too large and not get paid off. I know he has something. So I just decided to throw out a $25 chip and he doesn't think for too long and he actually calls. I show my king four and we are good. So that's pretty good. We got back at the lowest point of the session. We were down 200 and now we're going to go to the outro and see what the final number is. Alrighty, that's it for that. That's the part six. That's the end of that. It's crazy. Um, after I went to go get some drinks with my boys, ended up saying, fuck it, I'm gonna stay for a little bit longer and ran that shit up, man. I was in the negative. Now I had a couple good hands. I'm in the positive. So um, always good to see that. So I'm gonna put the tally right here so y'all can see where the bankroll challenge is at and what the profit is. It's about around 200 profit in about four hours of play. So that's pretty good. So hope y'all enjoyed. Like, comment, subscribe. And until the next one, I'm gonna holla at y'all.